Hi everyone. Um, as you just heard, what I do for work is many times related to uh, what we call social entrepreneurship. Um, I'm not going to spend the, the next 15 minutes defining what social, entrepreneur, social entrepreneurship really is. There are way more interesting things to talk about and we simply don't have the time. But to start off with a mutual understanding of the term, I would like to say that many entrepreneurs or social entrepreneurs uh, what connects them is that they focus on a challenge of soci societal, social or environmental challenge. And so do I. And with that you apply business and uh, entrepreneurial methods to solve and uh, combat the problem that you've chosen. So I'll start with introducing my problem that I'm, fi I'm, I'm focusing on. Let me just understand this. Yeah, so it starts with a problem. I, I normally explain to people that I work with work-related stress, which is something that I'm sure that many of us can relate to, including myself. However, uh, I focus on the kind of stress that comes from not having a job to go to, <laughs> which is the reality for about 370 people in today's Sweden. Uh, this is not a homogenous group, it's very uh, wide in terms of age and gender background. It's not a static group either. The number in itself is a little overwhelming, don't you think? So to make it easier, I've narrowed it down to a local perspective in terms of uh, the area in Stockholm where I operate in which is a municipality called Botkyrka. Uh, it's in the suburbs. It's an area known for many things, but among other things, it's known for its challenges in terms of employment, un unemployment and social issues. So uh, about a year ago, the municipality in Botkyrka uh, published a report that they called, you can, not everyone's gonna understand this now because it says from invisible to visible, and the conclusions were many in this report, but some of them that I, that I was particularly interested in were uh, these two, that 15% of the population in the northern part of Bochurka are what they call invisible. These are people that are legally in Sweden, uh, although the government and the municipality don't really know how they support themselves financially. It's not a static group either, but we're talking about 3,000 people, more or less. And this is only one municipality in Sweden. The other group that I was even more interested in were the uh, population of foreign-born women, also not a homogenous group. You'll find academics and non-academics and different ages and so, but what they said was that more than 50% of the foreign-born women are unemployed. It's a quite a number. At the time, uh, I was working as uh, a job coach. I was working, my job was to facilitate other people in their job application processes, uh, mapping up their labor market opportunities, etc. Uh, that's not a very easy job to have, not for me and not for the people that I was working with, since the labor market is tough. I was specifically working with women that are, that had little resources, little uh, experience of the Swedish labor market, or any labor market for that matter. This, their Swedish skills was a problem. Um, simply what they could offer wasn't required by this, the Swedish labor market. I'm a very uh, impatient person and I just, I didn't feel like this was working for me. So I started elaborating with solutions that could, uh, instead of searching for jobs, be creating jobs. Quite simple, <laughs> as an idea. Um, part of the story is that I'm also very interested in food, just as a hobby, on a hobby basis. Not patient enough to be a chef, because you need to be patient if you're going to be a chef. So I never considered that. 
uh, but food was always on my mind. And at the same time, I was looking for a cooking class for myself. And I wasn't really uh, finding what I was looking for. I was looking for a genuine food experience, uh, preferably from a man or a woman who would be teaching from their own culinary tradition. Uh, and I couldn't find that. So abstract ideas started to take form. And as with all business ideas, it takes quite a, a long time before you understand what you're doing, what you're talking about, and ultimately how to do it. Um, so I kept elaborating and I kept asking nice people for advice and disturbing people with my very abstract thoughts. So I would say a year, a year and a half later, I find myself running a catering firm, a catering service. I was, the only thing I knew from the beginning was that I was interested in what would work and what doesn't work. And that I wanted food to be a part of it because I saw that the people in the group that I was working with are, after years and years of domestic work, are naturally skilled when it comes to cooking. It's not a very innovative, revolutionary discovery. Uh, I think making something out of that is what makes it innovative. So I'm going to take you through uh, the idea and what I do. Basically, our business idea uh, that I for now call Food for Thought, which is all about using food as a tool to create jobs. So, as I said, you start with a problem. If to simplify it, the problem at hand was unemployment, right? Uh, next up in the model was the skills uh, possessed by the women that I was working with. What I understood that we needed to add was real work. And what does real work mean? I'm sure it can mean many things, to, depending on what field you're in and what relationship you have to your job. But I've, I've chosen to define real work as work where you have a customer at the other end of your task, of, of your job. Simply because when someone else is, is uh, willing to pay for what you do, it's a receipt of your competency, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a way of understanding that I'm good at what I'm doing. Someone else is willing to, it's good, it's so good that someone else is willing to pay for it. So the relationship with clients, I thought, was really crucial. Local and organic produce, um, to me, makes a lot of sense if, if I'm going to spend a lot of time working on food, with food, using uh, organic produce is, a, is just a matter of quality. And lastly, that will create food with added value, added social value, added environmental value. So this is what we do in the catering service that is today a catering service. I'm hoping that five years from now it could be more than that. It could be running school kitchen contracts and, and different things. Uh, all with the vision of creating as many jobs as possible because that's the goal. And adding to, to Sweden as a food nation because Sweden as a food nation is about, more, is about more than just the Nordic traditional flavors. There is much more. In Bochirka, over 100 languages are spoken, so you can imagine how many hidden recipes that there are, potentially. Next picture is uh, what I've chosen to use to explain the relationship between social impact, which is a term that we often use in, um, when we talk about social entrepreneurship. So the relationship between our social impact and making money because there's a lot of taboos in this field. There's a taboo on making money and doing good or making money and saving the world, whatever you want to call it. So I think this one is necessary, and this is what I'm really, really passionate about. It might not look that fun, but to me it is. So basically what you have, I'm going to point a little bit, down here is unemployment at high individual and societal cost, right? 
unemployment is very expensive to the individual and to the society. Um, next step in in uh, specific, I'm I'm referring now to the group that I'm working with, which is um, long mainly long term unemployed, not only women but mostly women that I focus on. Uh, next step in in the process of entering the labor market. Uh, reaching regular employment is normally a non-paid non -paid internship or training in a labor market program, which is good, but it's still a cost. It's, it's, it's still not uh, enough for the individual, and it's still very ex expensive for society. So everything behind this line is not good enough, yeah? And we want people to be up here. We all do for ourselves as well. So, next step for many people is subsidized employment, and that could be part-time or full-time, different models. And this is what the, the Swedish uh, employment agency would do with many employers, and not only within the social innovation field, it could be any employer, it could be uh, IKEA. So, subsidized employment is a good step if you've been out of the labor market for a long time. So my main point with this illustration is, what is it, what's required for a, a company and a society to reach the other, the other side of this line? As you understand, if something is subsidized by the government, someone else has to pay the other part. So here we talk about the company's financial growth and stability. We don't necessarily talk about uh, maximizing profit, but it is, and I think it's very important to understand that in order to create those jobs, we have to make money. What's interesting is, what do we do with the money? So, what my goal, what my goal is to, obviously, to create as many jobs as possible, and that's when we can reach societal impact or social impact at societal and individual level. There's even methods where you can do the numbers of what this type of investment from the government will be um, when that money would be paid off, when person X goes for unemployment to taxable income and uh, well-being. So this is the core of what I do and the core of my passion and uh, why I'm using entrepreneurship as a tool. Um, I'll end with this. Learned many things on the way. We're still a startup. We have customers in the Stockholm area, uh, government agencies, corporations, NGOs, everyone looking for good food. Um, I've learned the importance of patience, uh, which I still don't have a lot of. Uh, the importance of a long and um, uh, big and long-term vision, endurance, which is obviously related to patience, <laughs> and strategies for scaling up to reach a wider social impact. My motivation comes from thinking big and thinking that we can create many jobs. It's going to take a while. But I, I really, really believe in the model that we apply. Uh, I also want to say that food is very timeless and universal need. We don't, in terms of empowerment, internally and externally, but mainly internally, we don't, the, the women that I work with, the chefs that I work with, they don't come to me and say that they want to be empowered. They say that they want to have a job. I don't tell them that I, I'm going to empower them. We talk about the food and we talk about the work and the quality. Our focus is to be a high quality uh, comp uh, food company. We have to live up to the same standards as anyone else within our field. And uh, doing so, I think we can add to Sweden as a food na uh, innovative food nation. But I think the word, I've struggled a little bit when preparing this, this talk today because the word Empowerment is not something that I use so much, but the previous picture is what I mean by empowerment. And lastly, I think that using your creativity, which is easy to do when you work with food because it's so fun, uh, and such a creative tool, uh, and innovation, you can find solutions where real needs on the, uh, real social needs can meet a market need or demand. I think that's really important to make it sustainable. That's my take on creative empowerment. Thank you.